it's almost like he took a shotgun approach, if you'll allow me to say that. You know, it's like, let's see what we can do to bring about the death of this poor woman, you know, to eliminate her. A picture-perfect family destroyed when this dentist, father of six, and husband of more than a decade allegedly murders his wife by poisoning her protein shakes. Well, he can witness her slowly moving or migrating toward that edge of the cliff where she's going to fall off. Investigators say he made incriminating internet searches leading up to her death. Like, is arsenic detectable in an autopsy? If you're, when you're an investigator and you're kind of digging into this, <laughs> and you're, um, I can only imagine, you know, that they thought that they had struck uh, evidentiary gold. Meanwhile, he was apparently having an affair with another woman. And he's still communicating with this third party. And again, that, that adds another chilling level. And now he's accused of evidence tampering from behind bars. If somebody has perhaps fear that something is going to happen to them as a result of them saying something, that's tampering. Our story begins in March of last year when 43-year-old Angela Craig starts feeling ill. Together, she and her husband, James Craig, also known as Jim, share six kids and live just outside Denver, Colorado. James has a practice in Aurora where he works as a dentist. That's all background to the symptoms Angela begins feeling, severe headaches, dizziness, and seizures. She even texts her husband saying, quote, I feel drugged. After her third trip to the hospital, Angela's condition worsens. She's put on a ventilator and later declared medically brain dead. She officially died on March 15th, 2023. But an investigation soon pointed in the direction of her husband, James, who made some questionable decisions leading up to his wife's death, like allegedly purchasing cyanide and arsenic on Amazon. To piece together all the elements in this case, I sat down with forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan. The poisoning itself is what would be referred to as a slow dosing. You're trying, I think, a perpetrator would be attempting to get enough into this individual system over a protracted period of time so that it masks itself as something other than an acute poisoning. So it's almost like a, a chronic event where there's like this kind of slow downhill. And, you know, the, uh, the potassium cyanide would, you know, it would kind of manifest itself in a chronic state of lightheadedness, um, maybe shortness of breath. Um, you might have issues with discoloration of the fingernails, um, which should be a clue, I think, many times. Um, and as the, as the body itself becomes more uh, uh, hammered by, you know, this toxicity over a period of time, eventually death will follow. According to Morgan, symptoms of poisoning could be masked as some sort of other illness. Even still, it's not super easy to get away with. It would have, it would have a manifestation of perhaps they're having some kind of respiratory event. It could lead certainly to a cardiac event um, and perhaps a coma. And if you've got those other things kind of leading up to it from a clinical standpoint, you can say, well, yeah, you know, perhaps this was, she had like congestive heart failure. Um, maybe, maybe just maybe, uh, she suffered a myocardial infarction, which is, you know, uh, a fancy term for a heart attack and that people would just kind of give it a glance and then move on. But, you know, that wasn't the case. So it's really hard to get away with. And according to investigators, they know exactly who was responsible for Angela's death, her husband. Per the criminal complaint, James made some strange moves before his wife died, specifically through his work. A coworker told investigators she saw James in an exam room with the lights off using a work computer. This was odd because James had his own office computer and personal laptop he regularly took to and from the office. And when investigators took a look at the search history, they allegedly found searches like, quote, how many grams of pure arsenic will kill a human? Is arsenic detectable in autopsy? All you need to know about arsenic poisoning. Top five undetectable poisons that show no signs of foul play. 
how to make poison and the top 10 deadliest plants they can kill you. Just based on internet searches and that sort of thing, you're thinking that this is something that is greatly premeditated. There's planning that goes into this. And I think that that's what makes this even more insidious, if you will. Yeah, the internet searches, I'm glad that you brought them up because at least to me, and according to investigators who use this in the criminal complaint, it was pretty incriminating. Some of the things that he Googled or looked up was how quickly these things work or whether they show up in an autopsy. Do you find that those searches would be incriminating? Gosh, yeah. I mean, look, you know, I get, I, I got to tell you, you know, in, in my world, you know, even working at a university or doing research for any program that I've you know, that I appear on, I worry sometimes when I do searches, <laughs> you know, uh, because I'm trying to get a background on something, trying to understand. You're talking about a, a practicing dentist who has, um, you know, patients that are coming in to see him for dental care on a regular basis. Why, why would you be searching out, um, you know, uh, whether or not those of us in the medical, medical legal field are going to be able to pick up on uh, you know, the poisoning, you know, in someone's system, uh, why is that of interest to you? Because it, there's no, there's no application for that professionally for him. So our expert, a forensic death investigator tells us a dentist would have no use for arsenic or cyanide, but investigators say James ordered both. On March 13th, just two days before Angela died, one of James's co-workers accidentally opened a package for him. Inside the package, she saw a biohazard sticker and what said potassium cyanide on a circular canister. She later Googled what potassium cyanide was used for and saw that Angela had the same symptoms. He's a dentist, but he, you know, at his heart, he's a scientist and understands human anatomy, physiology, he certainly understands, at least at some, some level, uh, the toxicity of, of, um, of heavy metals, which, uh, you know, is, comes into play here because we're talking about arsenic as well. It's not just potassium cyanide. James had allegedly ordered this item from Amazon and also arsenic. Just a note, the description stated that arsenic is often believed to be used for murder, as it has been in many crime novels. The second portion of the informative description stated that the real danger is in swallowing it, which could very well prove fatal. So the way that he ended up getting these poisons that were allegedly used to murder his wife, yep. the cyanide and the arsenic, there are receipts that he ordered these on Amazon. Is this something that is easily accessible for people or could it be because of his background in the medical field as a dentist that he was easier, it was easier for him to get his hands on? Yeah, I think that that's, uh, again, you know, I'm kind of projecting here, but I, I'm thinking that perhaps the fact that the position that this individual held uh, within the medical community, within the dental community, uh, maybe he got really confident in the idea because, you know, that's kind of a, it's kind of a bold move. You know, this is no different than going out and, you know, having a traceable weapon because, you know, the, these elements are in fact weaponized. So if you're talking about a firearm, if you're, if you're, you know, uh, going out and purchasing elements of a firearm or maybe a firearm itself, and you're creating this digital trail, and then all of a sudden you wind up shooting somebody, uh, there's going to be, you know, signs pointing to this, um, with, with these items, these toxic items that he's ordering, you know, through Amazon, as you had mentioned, um, it would be uh, a definite red flag. Uh, but I think that he thought that he could fly under the radar, perhaps from a clinical standpoint, you know, maybe he could rationalize it. What's more, investigators say this wasn't the first time James tried to poison Angela. We already mentioned the text Angela sent James writing, quote, I feel drugged. But the criminal complaint goes on to allege, quote, when Angela was discharged, March 14th, 2023, she made accusations that James had poisoned her. Angela said something to James along the lines of, there are poisons they do not test for. A friend later spoke with investigators and said Angela and James's marriage had always been tumultuous. James had multiple affairs with several women told Angela he had been addicted to pornography since he was a teenager and drugged Angela approximately five to six years ago. 
If you go through the criminal complaint, there are hundreds of text messages between Jim Craig, his wife, Angela, and other people. And some of the things that really stood out to me are allegations that this wasn't the first time that Jim had attempted to poison Angela. He actually has texts where he says to her, hey, for the record, based on our past, I did not drug you. Could that be brought up in the case as it moves forward? I mean, he may have attempted this before. Yeah, most certainly. Yeah, it could be because, you know, what is it? What does it go uh, go to establish? Well, it establishes his state of mind. It it goes to this idea of um, of planning, <laughs> and that's that is huge. You know, in a case like this, this this is not something that would say. For instance, if you're if you're thinking about it from the perspective, it, it's dependent upon what law, uh, how the law is written in any particular state. But uh, when you're looking at a case like this. Um, and you begin to think about premeditation, you know, that's the big element here, right? You know, how much thought is going into this? And I have friends in, in uh, the legal side of the house that will say things, you know, like, you know, premeditation can be formed in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, it can be. However, when you have this, this long chain, you know, of planning, and, and you're talking about this, you know, how, how common is it to talk to somebody about, uh, poisoning or uh, having to say, I didn't poison you. And then all of a sudden you have an individual that has died of poisoning. Um, it's, it's quite damn. Witness the lies. I didn't lie to you on that polygraph, I promise. The cover-ups. I could see his brain on his... The moments they confessed. I grabbed one of the kitchen knives. I outrageous police interrogations i know i forgot the head i wanted the head you have to see to believe oh my god law and crime interrogations subscribe today but there's more james was allegedly in a relationship with another woman during all this investigators found emails that were quote intimate in nature and contained sexually explicit conversations there were also travel plans within those emails to redacted. The first travel dates were March 8th through 10th, 2023, which showed redacted traveling from Austin, Texas to Denver, Colorado. Angela was in the hospital during March 9th to 14th, 2023. So according to investigators, James had the other woman visit him while his wife was dying in the hospital. There's also an email from the woman featured in the criminal complaint. In it, she stated she knew it had to be hard what he was going through and that she wanted to be there for him, but did not want to mix in with his family and friends and pretend to only be a friend when there was something more. She also signed the message, I love you. Then when we're looking at his wife, Angela, who was going in and out of the hospital several times, because as you yep. mentioned, it was low dosage of the poisoning. Right. So while she's there, we have lots of texts where he seems to be this caring husband. But at the same time, we later find out he's emailing with another woman. So he's having an affair with someone else. And investigators say that that could be motive. What do you make of that? The trick is this. When you, you enter into this clinical state uh, in a hospital where this woman is being treated, and you'd mentioned, and we had mentioned both, you know, low dosing. Clinicians don't typically, their mind doesn't automatically default to, well, this is a poisoning. You know, they're, they're trying to solve the problem that they see, let's get her healthy. But then uh, after, you know, this, this substance has built up in her system, it's kind of, you know, you get to this point of no return and he can, he can witness this. He understands this clinically. He can witness her slowly moving or migrating toward that edge of the cliff where she's going to fall off. And then he's still communicating with this third party. And again, that, that adds another chilling level. This is even, this even goes beyond somebody just randomly walking up and shooting and killing somebody you're, you have before you, uh, which you have an understanding of, because again, the clinical background, you understand what's happening to this poor woman right before your eyes, you see the pain that she's going through. Uh, you see these changes in her body, somebody that you have said that you actually loved at one point in time. And, but yet, you know what's happening at a cellular level with her body as it's breaking down, but yet you're still maintaining contact with this third party that you have this desire to be with. 
And again, I think that that's the most chilling element to this whole case. Then there's James's complete refusal to have an autopsy performed on Angela's body after she died. You know, from a forensics perspective, we we understand, we try to be as compassionate as we can, you know, with families that they're saying that they don't want an autopsy. We understand it's been a hard road. However, um, our for us, our default position is you've got a, a woman who's young. She has no kind of previous medical history, anything that, that rises to this level. You would think, again, I go back to his clinical uh, background. You would think that, well, she has a problem. Don't we want to try to solve this and understand uh, the causality here? Because this could translate to our children. You know, this could be uh, this could be a death sentence for them later on if it's some kind of, you know, metabolic thing that's going on with them that they're genetically predisposed to. You'd want to have those those answers, and dependent upon how to what level these protests rise to, uh, uh, investigators will gauge that. If it's if it's so over the top where they're so demanding that they don't want it, and they're you know they're uh, you know slamming their you know, their fist on the desk and proclaiming this is not going to happen. Um, and they do it over and over. That's going to be a big red flag for us. So if investigators were able to do an autopsy and they look into it, what would they find in terms of the poison, what it had done to her body? Yeah, you would see changes uh, uh, at in the organs. And, you know, we, we look at these things. Uh, you talk about, you know, uh, when an autopsy is done, that's what's referred to as a gross dissection. And I don't mean gross in the terms that people generally believe it uh, to be used in. I'm talking about gross and kind of with the unaided eye. And you look at the changes that go on in the body and that can be displayed. Uh, sometimes you can appreciate it, uh, these changes that will occur in the organ systems. But uh, one of the other things that you're going to look into is when we do histological samples and that's where the organs you know because the purpose of us doing the examination is to uh, take sections of of these organs and then uh, prepare them and put them on a glass slide and then you can see changes you know at um, uh, what we refer to with the aided eye that is microscopically you're sitting there and you have a pathologist that's going to be going over these slides and they'll say, oh, wow, these are changes that are consistent with being exposed to some type of toxic element. And that that would be a dead giveaway that you're that you're looking for at that point in time. Days after Angela died, James was arrested and charged with first degree murder. James was also charged with one count of solicitation to commit tampering with physical evidence. Prosecutors alleged starting before he was arrested, James tried to get a family member to tamper with evidence. Then just this month, prosecutors added an additional count of solicitation to commit tampering with physical evidence. So far, the person hasn't been named and it's unclear what James allegedly asked them to do. But based on the investigation, we know James allegedly had a history of speaking to witnesses. He sent a message to a longtime friend after Angela died, reading in part, quote, If we were ever friends, please do this favor for me. Please don't talk to anyone about what we talked about last night, including law enforcement officers. You are under no obligation to answer their questions, unless you are served a subpoena and you will do more damage than good to my family. And that isn't legal either. Well, uh, you're you're attempting to if you have a witness that say the prosecutor has identified that, or in your mind, even if the prosecutor hasn't identified that person as a witness per se, um, in your mind, uh, and I'm talking about his, if you have identified them as a potential witness and you're going to manipulate them in some way, whether it's through force or money or whatever it might be, you're extorting. Um, that can qualify as witness tampering. And what you're trying to do is impede the flow of information from that witness back to those that are doing the examination of the witness, okay? Whether it be the defense or the prosecution, uh, you know, the court in general. So that can lead um, to, you know, perhaps influencing the outcome 
of, of a trial. Uh, you know, when we think about uh, you're looking at uh, someone that might take the stand in the midst of a homicide trial, and if they've been influenced in any way by say, okay, you don't need to say this. Do you remember when this happened? It's probably not a good idea to actually mention that because it's going to not bode well, you know, for the defendant. That's tampering, you know, at a, at a very base level. Uh, the trick is the prosecution has to prove that, and that's, you know, that's kind of, that that can be kind of difficult. It's not as difficult to say like a perjury, but it, it can be difficult. And you're looking at a lot of circumstantial evidence if there's anything electronically or notes being passed. And, uh, you know, I've actually heard of some, um, some cases, you know, where people can just merely give someone a look. And if there's that, that element of intimidation that's in there, that can be interpreted that way as well. So if somebody has perhaps fear, that something is going to happen to them as a result of them saying something, that's tampering. All this is likely something we'll see at James's coming trial. What would you expect as far as the prosecution's case? Would they have people like you, potentially expert witnesses, called to discuss what happened to Angela in her final days? Yeah, you're going to have, it's going to be fascinating to watch, and this is why. Um, because it's not just going to be people in forensic practice. You're going to have clinicians that treat people, you know, for things uh, like poisoning. Um, you're going to have uh, uh, individuals that will come in and they'll talk about uh, cases that they have examined over the years with toxicity relative to, uh, you know, cyanide or arsenic or, you know, any of these other elements that are involved in this case. Um, and they're going to be asked in very descriptive terms to, well, let's delineate between all of these and what's going to be, let's see, what would be the most effective delivery method for this? You know, uh, uh, would it be, say, for instance, in um, a shake, you know, that you're going to create and, and apply it that way? What, what, what type of dosages are we looking at? And it's going to be kind of graduated. They'll say, well, if you, if you look at this dosage level, you might expect to see this. It'll be very subtle, but if you get above that level, then you're you're going to have these more acute manifestations where there'll be like, you know, severe nausea and vomiting and stomach cramps and all of these other things that might happen. Uh, you know, increase in shortness of, or events of shortness of breath. So it's going to be very detailed if you enjoy science, I think, uh, if you're a true crime uh, and trial watcher, I think that this is this is going to be a very compelling case for, for you. Does a crime like this surprise you that he would go to these lengths to allegedly murder his wife? No, no. And, you know, look, you know, the, <laughs> those superficialities, uh, I mean, and we see this, you know, even in today's context, it doesn't have to be a picture in the frame. We can see this just on any of the social media platforms where people, you know, kind of portray this this happy outward image and they they very well might have you know a house full of children that you would think it'd be full of love and care and all these sorts of things but all it takes all it takes is for one individual in a relationship to take their eye off the ball and suddenly you know you'll have this kind of malevolence that takes place in their life and i think that that's probably going to be explored uh in this case you know kind of the the, the relationship that he had with his wife and certainly relationships he may have had peripheral to his family that have led this individual to want to make these uh, these decisions, these fatal decisions. Right now, James Craig is being held on $10 million bond. He's pleaded not guilty and is headed to trial on August 8th. Reporting for Long Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie.